I'd like to start today by asking you to think about the last time you made something. What, just show me with your hands how many of you made something in the last month, a physical object. That's awesome. I think, are you all from MIT? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, say in the last year, how many people have made something in this room? About the same number. That's wonderful. I don't think that you uh, map to the general population uh, this experience. It seems like we've lost our desire to make things in this uh, community. And if you remember when you were a kid, that was so much fun to make something. So I'm here today to celebrate making and digital fabrication. Now, I made this with my friend Paul. I was in Northern Ireland a couple of weeks ago, and we made this for his kids. It's a um, sheep construction kit. Now, what we did is we designed it with open source software, and then we cut it out with a computer-controlled laser cutter. Now, my friend Donna Jay from India, he made this. It's a lovely, flexible circuit. It was an afternoon doodle for him. And he used a, a computer-controlled vinyl cutter to make that. And my, uh, a student, a graduate student at MIT, made this. It's far more complex. This is a multi-touch interface for his computer. Now, the one thing that all three of these projects have in common is that they were made in a fab lab, or fabrication laboratory, or as I like to call it, fabulous laboratory. And um, as background for Fab Labs, before I tell you too much about them, I'd like to give you uh, some inf ideas to where the research that created Fab Labs uh, came from. So in my research group, the, the Center for Bits and Atoms, um, uh, the framework for our work research is uh, digital revolution. It's around the idea of digital revolutions. And we're in the third stage of the digital revolution. So the first stage, we went from, in the first stage, we went from analog to digital communications with Claude Shannon's work. In the second stage of the digital revolution, we went from analog to digital computation, brought, bringing us all these wonderful uh, little uh, smartphones that we're carrying around now. And right now, we're in the middle of the third stage of the digital revolution, which is moving from analog to digital uh, fabrication, moving from room-sized factories, in fact, to digital materials, so materials that you send codes into uh, for self-assembly. At the Center for Bits and Atoms, we're really looking at the merging of physical science and computer science, and what happens when you make things uh, at that boundary where the digital bits of the world meet the physical atoms. And we're borrowing ideas from nature to do this. So, for instance, if you wanted to make a human being, you would start with proteins, you'd send a code into those proteins, DNA, and eventually you would grow with the form and the function of a human being, right? Well, in um, digital fabrication, what we're doing is we're sending codes of instruction into discrete strings of material and then um, asking them, in essence, to form uh, the shape and the function that, that we desire. The, uh, the advantage of working in the digital world is that you can send another code in saying, I'm sorry, we don't like this, recycle yourself. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way to operate. Now, to do this, we have to make stuff. And we make a lot of stuff at the lab. And uh, to, to enable that, we built a beautiful digital fabrication facility at the Media Lab. And it was so exciting to be able to build things all the way from the nano scale up to the building scale that our students said, I want to learn how to use all of this stuff. So about um, 10 years ago, we started a class called How to Make Almost Anything. And we had about 100 students show up for this class. And they, um, they, they ranged, uh, you know, they came from all walks. They were engineers and scientists and uh, architects and artists and hackers and business people. And we'd kind of uncovered a desire for digital, uh, not digital fabrication, but personal fabrication. And in this class, in one semester, you would learn all the tools and processes that we had available in the digital fabrication facility. And the student had to come up with a personally meaningful project at the end of the semester 
um, that integrated many of the tools and processes that they had learned. So one of the first projects that came out of that was this. It's a web browser for parrots to go <laughs> and visit other parrots on the internet. Now this is a, uh, this, this is a dress that protects your personal space so that if, <laughs> so that if a, uh, a suitor gets too close, it deploys spines and keeps them at the appropriate two feet. <laughs> and this is a, um, a plotting machine that's made from uh, pr press fit Lego circuits. It's a really interesting project. This is a, uh, just, just expressive furniture that a, a student made. And Carolina made this wonderful project, which um, solves a problem that a lot of students have uh, at school, which is getting up in the morning. It's called the no sheet alarm. <laughs> They're just wildly imaginative, you know, it's our students. But Carolina, she did not understand programming when she started this project. She did not understand engineering necessarily, and she didn't really know how to make things. But in the, pro in, in, in the course of this one semester, she pulled for the knowledge that she needed when she needed it, and she applied it right away. And that's a very powerful learning experience. So this is the class that inspired Fab Labs. Now, Fab Labs are prototyping facilities in essence, and we put these out into the world, all over the world, to basically ask the question, if you could make almost anything, what would you do with that capability as a community? And we were pulled first by developing world contexts and also uh, rural communities. Um, they were all interested in measuring and modifying the world around them. But since then, it's kind of gone viral. We have more than 135 labs in 27 countries, and we're experiencing our own version of Moore's Law, so uh, doubling in size approximately every 18 months. And this is what's in a, in a fab lab. Um, it, they, all the machines are computer controlled. There's a laser cutter for making two and three dimensional objects. There's a sign cutter for making beautiful circuits like this and long range antennas. There's a, a small milling machine, a high resolution milling machine for making circuit boards and uh, molds for casting. Not pictured here, but also uh, included are a 3D printer, which those are becoming very popular, um, and uh, a large wood router that makes furniture and housing. And all of that is sort of wrapped together with an electronics, a very sophisticated electronics workbench that allows you to design, make, and program your circuits right there in the lab. And what we see all over the world is the same thing. Young people come into the lab, they are empowered by the experience of making something. They pull for the knowledge as they need it, and they apply it right away. So the educational experience is, is really good. Um, because it's iterative, you never get it right. It doesn't work the first time. You, you learn problem solving skills. You do it again and again until, until you get it right or until it works. We feel like this creates jobs in a few ways. Um, number one, you learn at a very diverse skill set that's useful in the um, digital world. Um, but also by inventing products and applications, you can create small businesses and job opportunity for yourself. Now this is our uh, fab lab in Ghana. It's at the Takarati Technical Institute. Yay! Go on inside. Now, uh, neighborhood children in Takarati come into the lab every afternoon to sort of just play. And this young lady watched us teach an electronics class twice. And by the second time we taught the class, she was handing us the parts that we needed to teach. So we said, well, why don't we let her make her own circuit board? And in fact, she did. She stayed till 11 o'clock at night and made her own circuit board.
My name is Valentina Kofi. I am eight years old. I made a stacking board. Now, I don't, outside of MIT, I don't have very many friends that know how to make a circuit board, so I thought that was pretty impressive. And we find she came back for years on and off to play in the laboratory, and um, some of her peers have gone on to, for, to uh, pursue higher education in STEM disciplines and or to pursue uh, careers, uh, technical careers, which is um, really amazing for a place like Ghana. Now, we're living in a digital world. Um, we're increasingly networked by the internet. Computing devices are ubiquitous, and the cloud is coming. And this is the platform for the knowledge economy. We're seeing lots of innovations come in, in, uh, around new media and online applications and services. But there's another opportunity for innovation, a huge opportunity for innovation in turning bits into it. So taking the things that the, the taking the ones and zeros of, the, of our computers and uh, designing uh, representations and then making those representations in, real in the world. Now, I'm sure you recognize these guys. They're terribly scary, our digital natives. They are so amazing with computers, and they can do anything in the virtual world. They put us to shame. But in the 21st century, digital natives are going to need to be um, able to make things. And this is a workforce development challenge. The 20th century workforce is a very different creature than the 21st century workforce. In the 20th century, you could expect probably to have a career with one company for maybe 20 years and or work with a large manufacturing concern. But in the 21st century, it's going to be different. You're going to have to, or we're there now, we're going to have to change jobs many times, learn new skill sets. In fact, one of the most important things you can learn is how to learn. Um, this is going to have to be a STEM-capable workforce. Um, they're going to have to be critical thinkers. They're going to have to understand cross-disciplinary um, problems, or as uh, Joy said yesterday, anti-disciplinary issues. And uh, they're going to have to be innovative. It's not going to be okay just to work. You're going to have to innovate. Now, uh, fab labs are uh, increasingly being adopted in formal education settings. A lot of middle schools and high schools right now are adopting them as well as community colleges. And we're starting to get our first results actually from Lev's um, part of the world, Cle uh, Cleveland. Um, uh, and it, the first results are very promising uh, from MC2 STEM High School. And then of course they continue to be a great way to promote STEM and uh, provide STEM learning in an informal uh, educational environment. And the inventions that are coming out of the lab, they are absolutely amazing. There are housing, this is a solar house done by the uh, Barcelona Fab Lab. Um, these, this is a, a wireless infrastructure that we deployed in um, Jalalabad in, in Afghanistan and also in Nairobi. Um, this is a new business based on electronics um, out of Iceland. Uh, and then lots of sort of agricultural and um, rural, uh, small innovations, uh, localized innovations. So maker spaces, hacker spaces, tech shops, fab labs, they're all a part of this do-it-yourself DIY growing community. And they're all catalytic environments for learning and for innovation. Doing it yourself making something is a very powerful experience. As educators, I would strongly encourage you to go out and make something and, and, and share that experience with the rest of us so that we can learn from you. I would also suggest that, um, well, just personally, I've been for the last 10 years running this network and this program and making things and discovering things and learning things with these powerful technology tools Go out and find your own, yourself a fab lab or a hacker space or a maker space and take advantage of these tools that are at your fingertips, these very powerful tools. I think you will have a fab experience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>